first presenters <coughs> are Mitchell. Maybe that. Like I'll just do this. Okay. Mitchell Akiyama, if I say it correctly. Okay. Uh, and Bethany. Ives. Ives. So I'll just read a quick bio. Mitchell. Uh, so Mitchell's a Toronto-based composer, artist, scholar. And he his work is grounded uh, on research in techno into technological mediation and storage. And his installations and his multi multimedia work investigate the relationship between historical narrative and sensory experience. Currently, he's pursuing a PhD at McGill University, and he's working on a dissertation that examines uh, field recordings across a variety of disciplines, from biology to folklore and sound art. Bethany, you come from New York. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bethany is coming from New York. I'm trying to, yeah, I try to cobble this from your uh, bio. So she harps on conditions, which she calls text, presence, prescience, instability, irrevocability, infrastructure, disuse, and this manifests as performance, installations, uh, publication, video, sound, and/or curation. Uh, Bethany holds an MFA from Bard College, where she also teaches. And the sounds a very cool sounding program, language and thinking program, wow. uh, and in just some teaching art, design, critical, cultural, sacred, poetic theory, history and literature at the School of Visual Arts at Pratt, and New York School for Interior Design. So we'll begin with their presentation, and what's the title of that? What do sounds want? Speculations on acoustic autonomy. Go ahead. Thanks. <coughs> Um, so what does it mean if sound never really dissipates, never goes away? If it continues to disturb the air ever outward until it encounters a void, running itself off its own tracks? Or if it lodges itself in other surfaces, manifesting as an imprint, a trace, an inscription that might be recovered or reactivated? What if a sound never fully stops reverberating? The protagonist of J.G. Ballard's 1960 short story, The Sound Sweep, is sound acoustic vibrations that do not die out, but rather remain a palpable residue accumulating wherever, wherever there are surfaces to block its passage. In Ballard's world, sound is far from being an evanescent or fleeting phenomenon. It is a persistent presence that bears on living things, people in particular, whether they can actually hear it or not. For this reason, squads of blue-collar workers, including the protagonist, a mute boy named Mangan, operate Sonovax, disposing of this excess sound sound that is more or less inaudible, and yet is a nuisance, even a possible danger to people's psychic health and the structural integrity of the built environment. For Ballard, sound exists in excess of human perception. It is not a phenomenon whose reality is predicated by audition. Sound is an autonomous entity, a thing with agency and the capacity to act on humans and other objects. Furthermore, its forceful presence demands that it be regarded with vigilance and care, something that must be constantly tended to. What this means is that, at least in Ballard's world, sound is real, a real autonomous force that lurks latently accumulating and threatening to act on those that don't abide by the codes of sonic hygiene. At one point in the story, a peripheral character warns that eventually unswept sonic resonances will build up to a critical point where they'll literally start shaking buildings apart. The entire city will come down like Jericho. Sounds, as Ballard portrays them, are vibrant matter, but also vibratory, and obey their own codes of speed and intensity. Sound finding an obstruction imprints itself. In Ballard's world, sound meeting with, sound meeting with the blockages of walls and ceilings leaves the residue of its interaction with solid surfaces. How this actually works is not clear, but Timothy Morton's suggestive description of how sounds get stuck is helpful. Morton takes the croaking of a frog outside his home as an invitation to imagine the life of one sound, its travels and its encounters. And this is a long quote. A single sound wave of a certain amplitude and frequency rode the air molecules inside the frog's mouth. The wave was inaudible to a mosquito flying right past the frog's lips, but sensed and said as a fluctuation in the air. The wave carried information about the size of an el and elasticity of the frog's mouth, the size of its lungs, his youth and vigor. The wave spread out like a ripple, becoming fainter and fainter as it delivered its message further and further into the surrounding air. 10,000 feet above the pond, passengers in a plane 
failed to hear the sound wave, although a faint glint of the plane's landing lights was visible as a brief wink of color reflected from the surface of the water. Reaching the ears of a nearby female frog, however, the sound wave was soon translated into hormones that told her that a young stud frog was close by. The wall of croaking caused the grasses in the pavement next to the pond to vibrate slightly." End quote. In Morton's account, sounds translate themselves, literally carry themselves across a medium and either find themselves fugitive or imprinted on an object. Morton writes, every object is a marvelous ar archaeological record of everything that ever happened to it. This is not to say that the object is only everything that ever happened to it. An inscribable surface, such as a hard drive or a piece of paper, is precisely not the information it records for the OOO reasons that it withdraws. And Morton, like Ballard, posits that the material residues or impressions of sounds are objects or, re or records of sonic events, fossils that, even inert, continue to offer a potential transcoding. If we could only read each trace aright, we would find that the slightest piece of a spider web was a, was a kind of tape recording of the objects that had brushed against it, from sound wave to spider's leg to hapless housefly's wing to drop of dew. Morton conform, confirms that what others have long known or suspected, that sounds never die without a trace. There are many words and tropes that we could use to get at the autonomous life of a sound. Bruno Latour might describe it as an actant, that, thi that is uh, a thing that quite simply acts on another thing. Jane Bennett similarly calls on us to recognize that non-human things and forces, including sound, are purpose purposive and alive. Such a simple statement, the acknowledgement that non-human, indeed inanimate or even seemingly immaterial things have a life and wield agency, confronts centuries of philosophical tradition that puts humans at the center of it all. It is a bad ontology, Quentin Mayasu tells us, that leads us into a trap he calls correlationism, that all that is known is known in, in the relation between thinking and being that the aspects and qualities of things that we perceive can never grant us access to the things themselves. Mayasu writes, uh, in short, nothing sensible, this is a long quote, whether it be an effective or perceptual quality can exist in the way that it is given to me but in the thing itself. When it is not, sorry, when it is not related to me or any other living creature, when one thing when one thinks about this thing in itself, for instance, independently of its relation to me, it seems that none of these qualities can subsist. Remove the observer and the world becomes devoid of the sonorous, visual, olfactory, etc. We are interested in the ways in which sounds bear on us and affect us insofar as they present themselves to, to us as sensory experience. But here we are focused, <coughs> our ears blissfully ignorant, on all the sounds that have eluded us or escaped us, those that continue to act on us even in their absence. It is unclear whether, it is unclear to us or whether or not they actually really do exist, persisting as they hurtle toward an infinity or enduring in some form as they become lodged in or dusted on more material things. This is part of our exploration here, but we are also interested in asking why it is that we have speculated for over 2,000 years that sounds in particular do have a life outside of human perception. Pythagoras, for example, concluded that motion of heavenly bodies, so astronomical in size, produced sounds so thunderous they were essentially too loud to hear. Sounds for the ancients also had a materiality that made them liable to be congealed. 2,000 years after his death, the Renaissance writers uh, Castiglion and Rabelais both recounted a version of a story they attributed to Greek, the Greek poet Antiphanes, a tale about a winter so cold that the frigid air caused the sounds to freeze in midair. It might seem reasonable here to follow May Sue's lead and assume that some sort of sonic panpsychism prevailed in the pre-Kantian world, that sound was held to be vibrant and vibrant and vibrating and somewhat material. 
But it is not quite as simple as this. Many writers and thinkers writing in the glare of the Enlightenment have assumed or suspected that sound is very much itself, whether or not anyone cares to listen to it. The idea of frozen sound survived the correlationist turn in various stories and folktales. Raspe's 1785 classic, The Surprising Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and the American tale Paul Bunyan, for instance. For the 19th century mathematician Charles Babbage, sound could be demonstrated to persist by somewhat less fanciful, fanciful means. According to Babbage, the air itself, that medium that received and transmitted acoustic energy, might be thought of as a sort of recording device. Every atom coming into contact, thought Babbage, must bear the trace of its encounter. This meant that every sound to ever have emanated from a vibrating body would, much as in Ballard's story, remain suspended, real and yet enduring outside of human perception. The air itself is one vast library, wrote Babbage, on whose pages are forever, are forever written all that man has ever said or woman whispered. There, in their mutable but unerring characters, mixed with the earliest as well as the latest size of mortality, stand forever recorded vows unredeemed, promises unfulfilled, perpetuating in the united movements of each particle the testimony of a man's changeful will." End quote. <laughs> if there is something ghostly about Babbage's description of the persistence of a spoken vow even after the death of its speaker, this is because the history of sonic media can equally read as a history of the effort to commune with the dead. The phonograph, along with the microphone, would be able to capture what Thomas Edison described as fugitive sounds, waves of, as fugitive sound waves that would otherwise be lost and alternate to the inaccessible library in the air. While Edison, stood sound, uh, well, Edison understood sound to be immaterial, he also held that they were real things, spirits, that existed in a permanent and wayward state outside the fields of perception. In the popular imagination, the phonograph was ghostly both for being able to preserve on record the voices of people that would one day die, but also as a system for detecting, amplifying, catching the lingering vibrations of spectral presences. Such speculations were brought to their logical conclusion in the 1960s in the work of electronic voice phenomena, uh, EVP, pioneers Friedrich Jürgensen and Konstantin Radiv, variously employed magnetic tape recording and modified radios, each claimed to have captured voices from the beyond. Another guttural sounding entity complains they'll never believe us till conquest of English. They'll never believe us till conquest of England. <laughs> if sound, as we understand it, emanates from a source in the real world through force of vibration, EVP are events that never occurred, phenomena whose genesis lies in the spirit world, a sphere that apparently bleeds into ours. Whether authentic or not, whether distortion in a carrier signal or an equipment glitch, Jurgensen and Radiva were moved by something, by some sound made manifest, something that insisted, insisted its way through air and or the electromagnetic spectrum, leaving a trace on tape. In this sense, a recording insists that something there is also here, at once remaining and removed, a present place of displacement, if not a presentiment of it, and its emphatic mediumship lends itself to our imagining that we too are the medium in both time and or space at once. Like a card on a string tricks our eyes into seeing the bird in the cage, recto touches verso, and via this transaction of their being beholden to one, other, one another's inside outside, both become the other and possibly. The distinction between subject and object collapses when we take things slash forces seriously unto themselves. This is indeed what is happening in the writings of 17th century Austrian poet Katharina Regina von Greifenberg in her attempts to describe the sensation of being what we might take the liberty of deeming a recording device. In her meditations on the incarnation, passion, and death of Jesus Christ, she accounts for, the, for details of Mary's immaculate pregnancy firsthand, channeled and rendered through her own sensory experience. She registers Mary's contractions orally, speaking 
directly to the sounding agent embedded by proxy within her own body, addressing her subject both directly and indirectly simultaneously, saying, quote, as soon as I heard your voice greet me, he stirred and leapt for joy, because he does not yet have a voice to speak and cannot offer his service in any other way than through movement, end quote. Here and there, they're also, they are, are both presently expecting. They expect the way insistence the way the insistence of the recording is also evidence of the expectation for there having been a sound, say, which to record. From this vantage, Grafenberg is able to hear the voice of Jesus before it exists. A knot of pre-vocal flesh, he is moving inside her, and she interprets the gesture of these shifts as themselves speech. These, she says, occur in the body of a pregnant woman, just beneath the heart. And this correspondence of heart with the area in which a thing is held in suspension between expectation and fruition is not incidental. Indeed, as Eric Yeager points out in the Book of the Heart, that, uh, quote, scripture equated the heart with the innermost self, including conscience, memory, and volition, end quote. And further, that the, last, the classical Latin core, that is heart, was in medieval era devotional texts frequently used as synonym for various modes of consciousness, including the inscription of memory, replete with emotions upon the body slash self. This is where our word record comes from. Etymologically, a recording device is, paradox is paradoxical in that it spirits away part of the phenomenal world, pulling it close, and closing it inside a body. But this concealment in itself contains a, poten a potential revealing, because that which is stored faithfully, accurately, and can, can be re uh, reproduced without distortion. Sounds inscribe themselves onto and into bodies, altering them, throwing them off course, sending them into fits of passion and despair. Much in the way that Greifenberg, the incarnate recorder of the divine, experiences the voice of Jesus as an emergent or virtual form, eavesdropping on the intruder within her heart, as it were, sound recording simultaneously listens in on the flows of acoustic vibration that are incessantly swarming in the surrounding air. Christoph Cox wonders how we might develop an approach to understanding sound, sound art in particular, in terms of non-signifying material reality. Cox proposes a, uh, quote, materialist model of force, flow, and capture, end quote. Channeling Delanda, Deleuze, and Cage, Cox would have us think of sound as a sort of flux that might be constrained or curated by people, the gesture which for Cage constitutes art. This leads us to suppose that a recording device is irresistible and seductive to sounds. It lures them in with the promise of immortality, even though it offers only fossilization. But there's still something we have withheld, withheld from Ballard's story. There's another protagonist, a fallen diva named Madame Gioconda. She is tormented by the sounds of her past audiences whose applause taunt and mock her. Only the, only the residual sounds that haunt her are figments of her imagination. Although she is surrounded by the very real and audible residue of her everyday acoustic environment, sonic trash that her devoted sound suite Mangana disposes, disposes of daily, the sounds that afflict her are all in her head. Although the accumulation of sonic vibrations threaten to bring down the roof over her head, it is the noise within it that is the source of her distress. But even speaking of two discrete spheres, an interior and an exterior, is misleading in that it supposes that there is a distinct separation between imagined and actual sounds. This is what Douglas Kahn means when he writes, quote, It is commonplace, for example, for even the most dedicated musical esthete to listen at times more conservatively to the psyche than to the concert, oscillating between stage and seat, constantly interrupting or melding in a mix that is, ironically, the means through which an idea of unity is no uh, negotiated. Like the bird on the string whose persistent entrapment in the cage is an effective perception, sonic perception is an aggregate, aggregate of multiple discrete states that fuse to pr produce experience in excess of the given phenomena. Of the given phenomena. This is what occurs in the work of Marianne Amache, whose literally mind-altering compositions fool the ear into hearing tones that don't actually exist. In an interview, Amache claimed, when played at the right sound level, quote, when played at the right sound level, which is quite high and exciting, the tones in the music will cause your ears to act as neurophonic instruments that will seem to be issuing directly from your head. In concert, my audiences discover music streaming out of their head, popping out of their ears, growing inside them and growing out of them, meeting and converging with the tones in the room. Tones dance in the immediate space of their body, around them like a sonic rap, cascade inside their ears, and out to space in front of their eyes, mixing and converging with the sound in the room.
Amish is where it creates perceptual ghosts, sonic figments of the imagination, which shows us that the forces that bear on us are never fully present to our perception. But once again, the case of EVP shows us that there's a point of contact between two very different epistemologies and ontologies. On the one hand, sound, the sounds captured on tape by ghost hunters are real, whether or not they're actually produced by paranormal phenomena. But on the other, the ambiguity of these traces, their status as authentically haunted or not, is a matter better discussed in terms of what we want from the world of sound. This is what Joe Banks suggests, likening Jurgensen and Radiva's EVP experiments to the Rorschach test. Banks enumerates study after psychological study showing that the listening subject is susceptible to oral illusions, such as those uh, uh, cataloged by psychologist Diana Deutsch. in the end, no matter how we believe the world to be, we are left telling stories talk to each other about sounds that aren't really there or spirits whose materiality cannot be confirmed. That one would even think to listen for ghosts in the ether or to try and catch them on tape is not something that comes about because a spirit calls out. As Jonathan Stern shows, the, cultural, the culture into which sound recording and other sonic media were thrown was already primed to hail them as conduits and repositories for the voices of the dead. Stern writes, quote, Recording was the product of a culture that had learned to can and embalm, to preserve the bodies of the dead so that they could continue to perform a social function after life. The 19th century's momentous battle against decay offered a way of, to explain sound recording. The ethos of preserving a preservation described and prescribed the cultural technical possibilities of sound recording. While we hold that sounds have lives of their own, we are still unsure that materialist accounts are fully up to the job of describing the acoustic world in a way that satisfies their sense that no matter how sounds bear on us or transform us, we cannot help but interpret them, misunderstand them, make them th do things for us, even when they couldn't give a shit about us. Madame Chaconda, tormented by, her, by imaginary applause. Mangan, the sonobac operator and expert in the material persistence of sound. Thomas Edison, Friedrich Jurgensen, and Konstantin Radiva, the investigators of voices beyond the world of the living. <coughs> Katarina von Greifenberg's becoming a medium for uh, a recording medium for the divine. Each has something to tell us about the ways in which sound both acts on us and in its retreat from sensory perception calls out for interpretation and divination. Thank you. Okay, so let's, let's yeah, have some time for.